this is an interview for Peep Magazine where joined with documentary photographer Mark Pinder. We're at Northern Gallery for Contemporary Art in Sunderland. And Mark, we're finally here. It took a long time to get set up, but I'm so pleased you gave us the time, mate. You've, um, you look very busy and thanks for agreeing to do the interview. No problem at all, you're totally welcome, very welcome. Mark, you were born in Cumbria and then studied documentary photography at Newport College. Could you maybe talk about that, please? Uh, yes, I, um, I studied there from 1985 to, uh, to 1987, gaining uh, an HND in, uh, in documentary photography um, under the, uh, the magnum photographer David Hearn. Uh, in 1987, I returned back to the northeast where I had left four years earlier and started working as, uh, as an editorial and uh, documentary photographer, working for trade unions, uh, social issue magazines like Health Service Journal, Local Government Chronicle, Inside Housing, um, and then the venture newspapers, television production companies, etc. Did you go to college with um, Paul Rees? Kind of. Paul was uh, Paul, Paul was a couple of years before me, but he was actually working as a technician there at the uh, at, at, at the time. So, so you didn't actually meet. You didn't bump into. No, no, no. He was a technician. So, um, so yes, we knew we, we knew each other. We used to kind of like socialise quite a lot, and uh, no, Paul, Paul, Paul know, know each other well. Oh, right. So, did so. you um, maybe compare tips and compare like shots or? Um, no, not really. I mean, everybody kind of pretty much got on with what they were what they were doing. I mean, I mean it was all very. I mean, it was a very nice place to study because the, the department was very very small. I mean, it was only a two year course uh, because her and himself um, didn't actually want to run a degree course. Yeah, he thought that he could actually teach, you know, how to be a documentary photographer in uh, in two years, and it was and, and, and also kind of like didn't really want to. Um, Academize the, uh, the you know the uh, or intellectualize too much the whole process, even though the um, it was actually it was actually very very rigorous the uh, you, you know sort of like the background and the uh, you know the discussions, um, but yeah we, we all looked at each other's work, but it was um, it, it was um, it was more ad hoc than that. It was uh, it was a very it was a very laid back very 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 laid back place to be, and at the same time it kind of wasn't, and I expected you know sort of like the work quite rigorous. And uh, they worked quite hard as well, but um, but no, good, very good two years. Was it straight after that you come you come to Newcastle? Yeah, I moved back to uh, Newcastle in uh, in July um, 1987. Um, I mean, my options then were either stay in Wales, which I didn't fancy, um, move to London, which is where most of uh, most of my uh, kind of contemporaries did, you know, um, or or come back to the northeast. And I'd lived in London a couple of years before that, and I just, I didn't really fancy going back to London. So as I came back to Newcastle. I mean, the burning question, Mark, is what possessed you to come to Newcastle, uh, Scotswood? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> money, um, you know, it, it, it was, you know, I mean, I, I mean, when I first moved back, I, I, I did six months on the dole just to, I could um, qualify for the enterprise allowance scheme which is that scheme which the government had, I think, to massage unemployment figures, whereby you could do, give you £40, 40 pound a week for a year just to, uh, to keep you off the dole and, um, you know, still get your housing benefit paid. So, so it was just a case, it was finance. It was, uh, you know, I, I was skint, I had no money, and, um, you know, trying to rent a flat or, or, or a house somewhere like Jesmond or uh, wherever it was, just sort of forget it. And I'd, yeah. I'd had enough of communal living. I did not want to live with anybody ever again. I did not want to share a house with anybody ever again. Yeah, yeah. So what, was that kind of like a, like a, y, a YTS scheme or something? No, no, not at all. It was a thing that the, uh, the government did called, it, saying, called the Enterprise Allowance Scheme. And you had to kind of um, show willingly, you had to kind of put up a thousand pounds, which you either borrowed Whatever, just to show that you actually had some kind of like starting capital to actually become a, an entrepreneur, you know, in sort of, uh, you know, in, in, in you know, in, in the eighties when uh, you know, when that kind of that kind of thing was like all the rage, you know, sort of small businesses and that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, you got you, you got you got the money for uh, for a year, um, and I just kind of like. I just messed around for you, really, sort of, and then sort of like kind of got to the end of the year and thought, oh shit, I better, I've, I've, got, I've got to go and start, start making a living now. Yeah, yeah, of course. So you, uh, you found yourself in Scotswood. Yeah. First impressions? Um, 
It didn't seem that different to an awful lot for the Newcastle at the time. I mean, it's, 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 um, I mean, where I lived was actually on the terraces, like the kind of the Denton Road end. So, um, I mean, it's fairly, you know, that if, 87. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you could find trouble if you wanted it, but it's sort of, uh, I never really had any, I never had, never had much trouble there, you know. Right. And you, and you rented a flat in uh, Robert Street? In Robert Street, yeah. Well, because um, myself and my granddad, we lived on a White House Road. All right. Yes. So it's not that far away. Just back towards Elswick, back towards Newcastle. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of. Um, there is a saying that um, if you live a couple of meters from from the Tyne, which we did, you're a proper Geordie. Yeah. I, have you heard that before? I have heard that. Yeah. So that so, that must make me a proper Geordie. Uh, indeed, maybe it's, it's that kind of it's kind of you know sort of like being a being a proper Cockney, you know. Unless unless you unless you got bow bells, then uh, let's just then then you're not a proper Cockney. So uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know if you, uh, there's a couple of things that I, I just want to run with you about being in a Scotswood. Can you remember maybe a 10 foot graffiti piece um, titled Meat is Murder? It that, was, that, ring, that rings a bell. Where, where, where was that? Yeah, so that, that was at the, at the, uh, the very top of uh, White House Road, just, just around the corner from the Pink Palace. And it was there for absolute years. I would have seen it, but I don't think I ever yeah. photographed it. Right. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, saying, I, mean, I might have pictures. I'd probably have to go back, go back through the archive. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure it was maybe a, a, a Smith's homage to the meat is, is murder. But <laughs> I, I, I just, I, I kind of half thought, I, I wonder if it was Mark who wrote that, because uh, he looks like a Smith's fan. And really, no. It's, it's, um, I, I quite like the Smiths, but I've never, I've, I've never been, I've never been into, I've never, I've never graffitied very much. It's Fair enough. <laughs> your work is brutally honest yet complicated. Could you explain your process? And are you a shy photographer? Do you like to know the people in the photographs? I do. Um, I am a very shy photographer. Um, I mean, in some ways, I think it's more to be. Is, I mean, as much a shy photographer as I'm a shy, quite, quite sort of quite reserved, quite a shy person. And in some ways, I think the, you, the act of photography actually kind of forces you out of your comfort zone to an extent. Um, but as I was saying, I mean, I've worked. I've worked as an editorial photographer, as a photojournalist, and as a documentary photographer for for 35 years. You know, working for like magazines, newspapers. Um, I mean, I started working for, you know, sort of the trade unions like, uh, you know, Nalgo, um, UP, Transport General Workers Union, because that was kind of allied with, you know, the kind of stuff that I was interested in, politics, um, social process, um, and that kind of thing. Um, so as, as much as possible, I've, I did actually try to um, kind of point my kind of my commercial work in, in a direction that would actually allow me to kind of fulfill as much of my, of my personal work as possible. Um, it didn't always work like that. Um, but I think the fact that I've actually managed to actually kind of produce this, this, this show um, is kind of testament to sort of like how it worked to an extent. And that's, I, I always had an idea about what I, um, about what I wanted. And there was actually a very important book called Survival Programs. Um, which came out in the uh, in the early 80s, which was like a like a snapshot of Britain in um, from 1975 till 1979, when Thatcher came to power. And this is kind of like where this sort of like the name Macromancy comes from. In that most people who see survival programs see it, see it as being a book which is about poverty or about deprivation or about slum housing, which it is, you know, very much in keeping with the sort of the kind of work that sort of like photographers like Nick Hedges were doing, you know, for shelter back in the 60s that helped to put, you know, housing onto the, you know, the kind of the political and social agenda. But within that as well, um, there was a lot of other pictures as well showing, you know, the Civil War, Civil War in Northern Ireland, for example, um, you know, trading floors on the City of London, um, you know, kind of political party press conferences and and, and it was so there's like so within the kind of like the micro story you know of like kind of if, if the individuals the conditions that they were living in the social conditions there was like a much broader story which had to kind of contextualized that within what was going on you know the sort of you know the deregulation of capitalism the financial financialization of the markets um you know the sort of you know the sort of Essentially, like the, the Thatcherite, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, the kind of like the Thatcherite changes to kind of British society that were to come, and, and this is where the idea of like micromancy comes from: is the idea of trying to get a broad, a, a, um, like a broad overview 
to uh, to try and get some sense of what of where the future is going, and that I believe that kind of politics is very much um, done very very gradually. Um, quite simply because if if you actually stop now and look back, if 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 you could actually bring come forward from 1970 to 90 today and look at what Britain had become, I think you'd actually be quite horrified. But I think it's just been done so incrementally. It's like you know, it's like boiling a frog. You know, it just gets done slowly. So until you actually notice that kind of like, oh God. It, 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 what's happened when you actually stop and look back you don't actually realize because it's been done so slowly and i think that's been done on purpose yeah yeah of course i mean why we're here today is 35 years of work including coal miners scotswood political and economical observations and all within a book called macromancy yeah um could i ask why why that why that title and what does it mean and I think you've already answered where the inspiration comes from, but yeah. m- but maybe could you elaborate on that? Of course, um, I kind of touched on that a moment ago. Um, but it is, it is this idea of trying to um, work more globally, or, or, or try and produce a kind of like a body of work which is more about the sort of the macro, you know, about the lo- about the larger issues than the than the smaller issues. But the way that I've done that is by is is by is by drawing images or drawing work from smaller from from smaller projects. Um, to actually fit into the, uh, into, the, into, the into the macro narrative, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff missing here, um, and that's as much to do with resourcing as anything else. In that, you know, it's sort of um, trying to actually work as an independent photographer um, can actually be very, very difficult um, from from a resource point of view. In, in that, you can you, you can either end in a situation where it can be like incredibly time poor where you're working on stuff which doesn't necessarily fit but you're making you're, you're living or you can actually have a lot of time but you're making no money so it's trying to sort of like kind of find that balance that that, that happy balance and um yeah i mean there's a lot of stuff that i would really like to have done but just i just didn't have the resources to do but um but I, th- I think hopefully it fits together hopefully it makes sense um i mean i think it's a fairly multi-layered piece of work you know and that's um you know, and that kind of obviously I've been working for 35 years, I'm 56 years old now, so I mean, so an awful lot of what's actually on these walls is going to be um, ancient history to a lot of people. Um, but at the same time, I hope that it kind of like, sort of like, it's, it's, it sparks an interest that people look at it and go like, that's interesting, what was that about? You know, to try, try and get some sense. And I, I'm saying I think the different things will, 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 will resonate with different people because I'm sure that old people will actually kind of like recognise an awful lot of stuff, like the black and white stuff on the wall, whereas obviously the last chapter, or the, or the third chapter rather, is more to do with like, sort of like more, more recent political events, you know, the rise of populism, the rise of the far right, um, you know, austerity, and, um, and like, like the beginning of the, uh, in the beginning of the, um, um, of the fight back, if you like, or the uh, or the resistance to like to, to to what to what is going on. Yeah, of course. Um, and just to mention that the the exhibition is called Macromancy: Britain and the Northeast of England, 1986 to 2022. Yeah, Mark, I think it's a good little opportunity to chat about the um, the photograph right behind you, about far right, and mm. um, maybe yeah. So what's I mean, I know what's going on here, but could you elaborate on why you were there? Were you on commission, or was this a, per- a personal piece? No, this was um, this. I was on commission for the Independent or the Independent on Sunday, the newspaper, and that day they sent me to photograph uh, an EDL march in uh, in Newcastle. So um, where the assembly point was for the uh, for the march was uh, was down at the central station. Yeah. So um, I kind of turned up and just as. All these guys have stood on this, you know, stood on you know, on the wall outside the outside the Roman Catholic Cathedral. Uh, probably had a few a few, a few drinks and uh, and um, but again, it's like but the reason I've actually included this because I think it's probably quite a strong picture. But it also talks about the way that kind of history to me is um, is recursive. You know, you'll, you'll you'll get themes that you know appeared 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, which kind of like never go away you know mm. so I mean, obviously on the, on the other wall in the black and white section is that photograph from a British National Party rally in Sunderland you know so obviously it's kind of it's the far right but from f- from two completely different eras but the, they, they never go away just kind of transmogrifies into um, you know into something else or uh, they'll find a different issue to uh, you know to uh, to exploit yeah of course of course 
The government closed the collieries in the 1980s, but I've looked through your work and I can still see um, what was titled Coal Scavengers in Easington Colliery in, a, in around 1987. Could you, could you explain what were they doing? Uh, it looks like they're, they're collecting coal, but, but the industry had kind of died for the, um, the engineering uh, industry. So what, were, they, were they collecting coal for a, a personal reason or? Different reasons. I mean, the, um, I mean most of the, a, lot, a lot of the pits were closed down uh, after 1985, after the miners' strike of 84, 85. Um, but there's still quite a lot of uh, there's still quite a lot of pits left, and one of them was Easington. Uh, Easington didn't close down until '93, I think. '92, um, '93. I mean, the announcement was made in the uh, was made in in '92, I think, when um, you know, that was actually under the major government, and it was Michael Heseltine was the um, you know was the uh, um, was the industry secretary at the time. So what this was was. Um, the colliery itself was actually on the headland above the beach at Easington, and the, um, they would bring the coal up to the surface. They would wash the coal, separate it from the, you know, from the shale and from the waste products, and then just dump all of the waste back onto the beach. So this wasn't actually uh, sea coal. Uh, sea coal is actually a natural phenomenon. That's you know that's sea, that's coal that's actually washed up on the beach. This is actually coal, which was, which was actually as a result of an industrial process. Oh wow! It was, right. um, you know, so what would happen is that locals would go down there, you know, collect it either to use domestically on their own fires or to sell on. I think the going rate was about two pound a bag. Wow, I say that because uh, some of them are using uh, BMXs to, to, to like yeah. put, the, put the coal on and stuff. But, it's, but yes, I mean, I mean the pictures themselves. I mean, it's like they're they're, they're quite timeless yeah. because you could actually look at it and say, well, you know, it's, there's, there's very very few signifiers as to you know when this is. I mean, it could be the 1930s even. You know, you have to look quite closely to see. Well, it is a BMX bike, yeah. you know, but it could be. Did you did you actually strike up any conversations uh, with these guys, Mark? We did, um, but it's. It, it, I wouldn't say it's, it's impersonal, but it, it's. Um, I never like to intrude too much. Um, I mean, the, the whole process of photography is, you know, is. Um, it, it, it can be kind of like can be seen as intrusive, and I do think you have to be careful about why you're actually doing things. Um, I mean, I've, I, mean I, I, I do know photographers try to photograph this and not had too much success because you've just been being chased away because of thinking, oh, are you, are you from the social or are you, are you there for whatever? And uh, oh, I, right, I, yeah. I, I never had that problem. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, obviously, I didn't, I didn't really want to start asking people's names. Yeah. You know, are getting, you know, sort of... You start sounding a bit like the police. You start sounding a bit like the police or something, you know, and it's sort of like, um, you know, but no, I mean, it's like I had no, no, no problems, no problems at all. Wow, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, for the for the people who don't know, coal was a lifeline for the in, the industry and played a huge part in the northeast's economy. Coal was fuel for the steel, the heavy industry, the engineering. But sadly, I mean, we're maybe touch now on maybe the government, Arthur Scargill, uh, Margaret Thatcher. I was. I mean, obviously Thatcher came to power in 1979. I mean, I was only do the sums. Um, I was 13. I was you were maybe there for the tail end of it. Yeah, I mean, I, st I, mean, I started working as a photographer in 1987. Um, I mean, some of the early pictures, the, I mean, the picture of Margaret Thatcher in the show was actually shot when I was still a student in Newport. And that was shot in, uh, in July, June, July, May, June. It was, it was, it was the election of 1980, 1987. Um, no, sorry, that picture, the picture in the show was actually shot when I was actually working, that was shot in that, that was shot in Perth, in Scotland, in 1989. Um, but I had actually photographed Thatcher and the Tories, you know, the Conservative Party conference in 1986, which is like where the 1986 of the show comes from, because that's the that's the earliest work. Um, and the way that the show is is, is kind of like narrowly structured is Britain and the North East of England, 1986 to 2022. So it's not exclusively about the Northeast, but it's, but again, coming back to this idea of like, kind of like macromancy, but it's the, the idea of how um, broader politics play into the social dynamics, the economic dynamics, the political dynamics of, uh, of, of this region. So the, so it's the first um, half dozen pictures so aren't particularly specific to the Northeast, but just kind of like play the, you know, kind of like, um, 
exist to uh, to kind of like place the project within the kind of political context of uh, of Thatcherism at the time. Yeah, of course. Do you do you get a sense of achievement that you have photographed an icon? Do you look back and think, yeah, I've been there, I've done that, or, do, or have you got no feelings or or what? Um. I'm not sure. I mean, I I, th- I think the problem, well, not the problem, but it's you know, it's, I, I think at the, at the time you um, you never actually kind of like see the significance of it. It's only actually when you come back 30 years later or 25 years later that you actually see how much has changed, you know, and how kind of how kind of iconic these characters are, you know, in a good way or a bad way. You know, it's uh, you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not going to cast um, I'm not going to cast judgment on that. Yeah, of course. You know, that's. I mean, this lady is not for turning, but uh, I will, I will just add that um, Thatcher actually stopped milk in schools, and I thought that was a complete travesty um, to stop all them kids from getting milk in primary schools, and um, and and I and I know for a fact that some of those kids looked forward to that milk because they skipped uh, breakfast or they couldn't afford breakfast. Yep. So, you know, she had to live with that and uh, she's long gone now, yes, of course. But um, I just feel it's, uh, you know, it's. I just feel I should say something uh, about that because yeah. I actually heard about kids looking forward to that milk. We've had, you know, 40 years since then to actually look back and say, well, it didn't work. Yeah. So to then to actually continue these kind of kind of austerity politics and this belief in the kind of like neoliberalism and the uh, you know and the sort of uh, you know and the uh, and, and, and like free market fundamentalism, to me is um, is just wrong. It just fe- it just feels perverse. You know, with, I mean, you know, with that you kind of like, you, could, you could argue that like, yes, she was wrong, but at least she believed it. But to then forty years later come along and still actually you know hang on to the same kind of ideology just feels, it feels cruel, it's, it, 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 yeah. it doesn't feel right. So, I mean, I've actually got more contempt for a character like Cameron, for example, than I have for Thatcher. You know, I mean, obviously Cameron is kind of, you look at him and think, oh, he's sort of, you know, he, he looks more normal or, you, look, you know, he, he doesn't seem, he, he doesn't seem as um, um, zealous towards the project. But like I say, to actually continue the project despite the evidence to, uh, to to its failure, it's, it to me just seems unforgivable. Yeah, of course. There was one thing that um, that kind of struck out that you recorded. I think I think you titled it uh, "Couch Potatoes," and it was uh, I don't know if it's Couch Potatoes, but you were watching maybe a documentary about Geordies, and I think there was some some kind of narrative about uh, nobody could understand what they were saying. And oh yes, that and that, 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 that picture's not on the in the show, but there's a picture yeah. in the book, and it was it just made me laugh. It was um, I said the couch potato thing. I can't remember. It might be some throwaway line I put in an yeah. Instagram feed, an, an Instagram post or something. You know, I, I can't remember the context, but the picture itself was. Um, it just made me laugh. There was uh, there was a, a Channel Four documentary on one evening. That's the one. Yes. And they had uh, they had they had a picture. They were filming some guy from I think from North Shields, and uh, no, I could understand it, but they actually felt they had to uh, they had to subtitle it, which I uh, I found funny. You know, I, mean, I should have been offended, but it was funny. And that, so. um, and I think you wrote something like uh, it reminded you of the movie Airplane where. Um, oh, I, I excuse spe- me, I, I, I can speak jive. I speak jive, <laughs> yes. <laughs> excuse me, I speak Geordie. I speak Geordie, yes, let, let me throw, I speak Geordie. Yeah, Mark, um, I'm fascinated with this shot with the two guys on the, uh, on the bike. I, I presume you slowed your shutter speed down and then kind of panned. Did you pan that uh, that through? I did, yeah, well, I guess. I, I, we're probably looking at... Kind of fast go. Probably look about maybe fifteenth of a second or maybe an eighth of a second. Yeah. Just uh, you know, just, yeah, just kind of just 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 panned it as uh, as they as, as they came past. Yeah, and that's like that's the old um, Stella Power one of the, one of the Stella Power Station. I'm not sure whether it's north or south in the in the background. That one that was shot in uh, in Lamington, just uh, at the far far west end of Newcastle. Yeah. So b- by my gauging, that's about from let's say from the Robin Adair. That's about half a mile to a mile. Along Scotswood Road, um, probably about that. Maybe, maybe yeah. Maybe um, two miles. Bell's Close in Leamington. That's where it was. <coughs> yeah. yeah. 
So could you could you maybe talk about this one at, at the bottom mark in uh, Fenham? Fenham. Um, yeah, I was I was having a, I was having a meal in um, Eastern Tate, which is like the Indian restaurant in in Fenham one night, and. Um, Came out and it just uh, there's not not this guy here, but there was uh, there was there was a bunch of kids who were just kind of out, just kind of misbehaving and being a bit getting up to no bit, good, get, yeah. just getting up to no good. So I kind of like oh, do you mind take some pictures? And they were they, they they were cool about it, you know. So um, anyway, so you just like wandered around for like kind of the park taking pictures. And uh, anyway, this, this 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 lad came walking up the street with his dog, and they must have known him. And it was like, Mister, Mister, show 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 us your dog, show us your dog trick, show us your dog trick. So uh, anyway, so anyway, he pulled out, uh, he pulled out his ball, and uh, yeah, held the ball up, and the dog started jumping up and down to uh, to order. Wow, absolutely bro- and, uh, brilliant uh, shot. What one uh, one of the things uh, as well, Mark? I don't know if you uh, agree with this, but I'm sure this happens up and down the country, but in. Uh, Fenham, like the West End or Scotswood, you would always you would always encounter something really strange um, <laughs> yes. within your first half hour there. Whereas everyone had a dog. Yep. Uh, it was either like an Alsatian or like pit bulls weren't uh, they really weren't, in they, then. They, they weren't really fashionable in those yeah, days. They weren't, they yeah, yeah, it was more your Alsatians if you had a Doberman, you were kind of posh. Yeah. But. Um, and then you would always see like a guy walking around with a TV. That would be like a common occurrence. Mm. Someone walking around with TVs in their arms, yeah. or pushing a pushing a TV in a on a shopping trolley or something like that. Um, could you maybe, if you've got any in your head, could you maybe talk about any any obscure experiences you've you've had down uh, Scotswood or anywhere for that <laughs> matter? Um. I suppose the most obvious one is like the day that I came out of uh, the, the, the day that I came out and walked down my street in Robert Street and then found somebody that stuffed a uh, burnt out mini down the or talked to mini down the uh, down the steps at the old Scotsman station. Yeah, that's um, that is, if I remember correctly, that is the bo- the bottom of St Margaret's Road. Um, no, but, but Robert. Yes, it was St. Margaret's Road yes. run, run along, all and, the way and, down, and Robert Street kind of came into it because that was the old uh, train station. Yes, the old Scotch Street, just just above where the Robin Adair, Robin Adair used to be. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, had to, I had to I had to walk the long way around rather than go down the steps. Saying it doesn't exist in any, any any dictionaries, but it does actually. There are actually definitions for it. It's like a different. It's like a di- measure definition because obviously you've got like necromancy, which is divination by dead by you know by dead things or dead people, and obviously the word mancy is is divination, and macro is is large. And obviously this is what I was kind of talking about before was this idea about trying to um, trying to get a sense of what the future is going to be from 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 the from the broader picture. So, but the the definition that's kind of online or the various definitions around is macromancy. Macromancy is divination by the largest thing nearby, derived from the Greek ma- from the Greek makros, large, and mantea, prophecy. Yeah. So now we're looking at uh, one of the pages. We're getting pissed off with you um, from macromancy, and um, this is what we were talking about with the excuse me, I can speak jive. Ah, yeah, um, what's actually going on there, Mark? Because is, is he handing him some kind of coin or something? Um, no, it's the tally man. It's the, uh, what this was is like, it was the last ever production shift coming off at uh, Vane Tempers Colliery in Seam uh, the day that the mine, the, the mine ceased production. So, um, so it's, 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 it's the tally, so you, you, you'd kind of have a token. Um, so when you come off shift, you'd actually give it to the tally man, he would take the token. And then if um, if there's one token less than there should have been, then knew that there'd been a man left um, left down at the pit face. Got you, got you. And again, there's, there's a fair amount of pictures from uh, you know from you know, ship launches and the you know, times I got access to uh, you know the Swan Hunter shipyards and such like. And that was from uh, 1989, you know, the launch of the launch uh, launch of HS Marlborough, and the previous picture was. Um, the beginnings of the construction of HMS Marlborough, so that's hence putting those two pictures together because they, you know, I mean, perhaps it should have been the other way around, but um, right, right, great shots. And again, the the, the, the I mean, the whole project exists within the uh, within within the um, 
oh, yeah. within, within, within the first photograph, which was from the Garden Festival. Um, and it, kind of, it just kind of suggests it's kind of like retro futurist um, future, if you like. You know, this, uh, the idea that we'd all be living in sort of, um, uh, you know, in 2001, you know, with sort of like flying cars out of the Jetsons and, you know, just this kind of, you know, this kind of like 1950s idea. And it's, it, it, but it references the, uh, the speech that Harold Wilson made to the Labour Party conference in 1963, which was um, quite a famous speech, which his, his great white heat of technological of, uh, progress speech, um, whereby he kind of like envisaged this idea of, you know, sort of the days of industrial strife being over and like workers and management working in harmony to kind of like, you know, to, to build an advanced, you know, economic and, uh, you know, um, technologically advanced industrial society in Britain. I mean, obviously it never happened because, um, you know, sort of we, had, we had the 70s. Yeah, of you course. You know, sort of, you know, management didn't, did, did, didn't invest, uh, you know, a very, a very, a, a very um, kind of like fractious uh, like industrial, landscape, industrial relations landscape, which kind of laid the foundations for, you know, for, for characters like Thatcher to come to power, you know, sort of like we, you know, we've got to sort of, um, we, 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 you know, we've got, we've got to, um, you know, curb the, uh, curb the power of the unions, curb the power of the working classes, you know, to, you know, to build, uh, you know, to build, to build another Britain. So, so essentially it was like, it was, a, it was a similar, in some ways it was, it was, it was, it was a similar vision but, but from but from completely different um, standpoints or com- completely different starting points, you know. Whereas Wilson kind of believed in sort of like industrial revolution, you know, the, you know the idea that kind of you know nuclear power would give us like unlimited amounts of un- you know unmetered electricity, and you know we'd, we'd all have the, ple- the leisure time and the money and the um, you know to, you know to. To do things, to, to do things artistically, or mm. to look after the garden and be working three days weeks, and mm. it's thing it never happened. So, yeah. so that was the first picture, the garden festival picture, um, which is then contrasted with the very last picture, which wow is that the, l- that, looks that, like something from um, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner or something. Kind of yes, but the, the, but the idea was to suggest that like this 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 is like this this is the dream being dismantled. You know, this is a spaceship, forty years later. Yeah. Just by, um, going back to that um, first shot, uh, Mark. Yeah. It kind of looks like a a, a Californian um, Americana shot. Uh, it struck me as as um, as a shot from that era, but it's it's obviously in. So Sunderland, um, Gateshead, yes, Gate, Gateshead, G- sorry, at the, at the Garden Festival. Yeah, I mean, it's really got that kind of yeah, it has. that retro futurist vibe to it. But that's but that's the um, like one of the main motifs running through the whole project is is science fiction. Yeah, you know, it is um, you know, I mean, I, I reference it a few times in the uh, you know in, in the um, in the work, and let's let's find. You know, I mean, it's like here. It's like when the spaceship lands. You know, mm. I get another photograph from the um, from the Garden Festival. But it's the idea being to sort of suggest that sort of when reality kicks in. You know, when sort of like when you actually leave the space. It's you know, it's sort of like the it's just a dream. It's it it, 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 it feels slightly illusory. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And again, it's um oh, did we pass um, Narnia? Oh yes, which we'll come out. Yeah. Which I thought was um, Paul Paul Ray's shot. Paul, Paul, Paul Ray's shot. I, no, no, it's, um, I, I, I do apologise. No, no, not at all. Um, but again, it's like we have, you know, it's kind of like this reference in this picture here, I and mean, this is um, like referencing Blade Runner. You know, oh, clubs, really? Because obviously Rid, Ridley Scott was from uh, from Teesside. Yes. So apocryphal, so the story goes, it was, um, you know, it was it, it was the chemical landscapes of, or the chemical plant landscapes of Teesside that influenced the uh, that the visual style. Of that the cityscapes in, right. in, in Blade Runner, you know. So, oh wow, that's really cool. And then we see a lot of uh, colour coming into your work now. Was yeah. was that a, a conscious thing, Mark? Because I read about um, Paul Rees talking about his shots, um, how a lot of doc- documentary photographers come into the north and uh, shooting the pits and the mines and in, uh, in, uh, in the streets and. Uh, women hanging clothes out and yeah. all guys with flat caps walking down the street. A lot of them were in black and white and uh, yeah. he kind of, I wouldn't say revolutionised, but 
are you aware of some of his conversations about wanting to turn to colour? And did he talk about that with you? We did. I mean, I, I mean, it's kind of. Um, I mean, Paul was very much, um, you know, with, with the zeitgeist of like what British documentary was doing at that time. That moved to uh, that moved to colour away from the sort of you know the gritty black and white. Um, you know, we obviously had like kind of you know very important photographers like uh, like like Paul Graham, for example, and uh, and Martin Parr. You know, photographers like Martin Parr, Paul Reese, Paul Graham, who who, who kind of like essentially took. Um, kind of like an like an American aesthetic, an American, you know, kind of American new color photography, you know, sort of like photographers like, um, um, uh, like you know, like Eggleston and uh, you know people like that who kind of like essentially redefined American photography. But yeah. it was like, but, but, but again, but, but I mean, I was working in color um, and black and white pretty much at the start of my career. But a lot of the kind of like the personal stuff I was doing in black and white, largely because it was, it was resources, um, you know. But I, I was also working on transparency as well, and I just dread to think how much of that transparency work I'll never see again because a lot of it was shot on commission for magazines and clients, and never saw that stuff back. Wow! You plus, know, which is plus a shame. you're shooting on film as well. And shooting on film, so I mean, I mean, shooting digitally is far easier to actually kind of maintain control. Well, it's it's kind of a double-edged sword because the problem with digital is that it's because it's um, it's infinitely reproducible, it's very easy to steal, but it also makes it far easier for you to actually main, can maintain control of your own archive because um, you don't have to give originals to, uh, to clients or to, uh, or to end users of material. Yeah. But, I mean, I, but I mean, there is actually uh, an affectation. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. But there, I mean, there is kind of an affectation in the book as well, in that the, the first chapter, Thatcher Major Years, um, is is purely black and white. I mean, I was shooting colour, so I could have actually included the colour in there, but I decided not to. And it's a little bit like the Wizard of Oz, you know, with the you know, they're in Kansas, and it's all it's all mm. black and white. So when they get to Oz, everything turns to everything turns to colour. So I did actually make a you know a conscious decision to go from you know the sort of you know the documentation of the uh, you know the, the Thatcher Major years, the Tories years, and then everything suddenly became kind of. Multicolored, you know when you know it was like with, with, better, with yeah. a new layer because obviously Sin can only better was like kind of things yeah. can only get horrible fucking song, yeah. um, <laughs> but that was kind of taken on something. something so, so the whole thing is like there's the, there's an irony in the work, you know. It's I mean whether it works or not, I don't know. That's that's obviously up to the viewer. I mean it might be it might be too obvious, but then it's I shifted the color. Ah, I love this one. You know, sort of, uh, you know, with it, with it, with it, with it, with the new labour years, because like, you know, it was cool. Britannia it was like everything bright. It was like you know, the days of austerity, the days of sort of, you know, the days of poverty, and the, you know, the yeah. days of like kind of, you know, they they were over. So, so yes, it was it was actually a very the, um, the young cool Blair, the young cool Blair, cool Britannia, and then yeah. uh, then, then obviously ah, uh, oh, you've got Jim uh, Jim Bond that I, I just happened to briefly see. Oh yes, um, where is he? Uh, yeah, there he is. I mean, that, I mean, that picture should really chronologically be in the uh, in the first second. It was actually shot just before. The, it was actually shot on the tail end of the um, the Conservative years. In the uh, it, I think it was shot in nineteen ninety six or ninety. I'll tell you exactly. Yeah, Na- ninety six, the year before Blair came to power. But um, I've just stuck it in because it, it, it I needed it to actually make a point. Yeah. It's, um, you know about the sort of the casino capitalism and the sort of yes, of course. You know, and the you know the the collapse of you know the collapse of Northern Rock. But also, I mean, this picture here was a was a protest for, against you know public sector workers against low pay from 1999. You know, so two years into the Blair years. And again, it's like this idea about history being recursive in that it's coming back now. You know, it's kind of you've got public sector strikers strikes going on and like you know public sector workers you know sort of like striking so it's yeah. like it's, it's, it never went away it never yeah. got sort of and again it's I absolutely love Jim because um, they're, they're showing a lot of repeats now on uh, Bullseye, oh, bullseye yeah. and, um, uh, I mean one of his first words is uh, are you working <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you're both are working uh, aren't you and so oh no Jim I'm, uh, I'm unemployed at the moment but you want to work, don't you, son? Yeah, you're, you're, lo- yeah. yeah, you're looking for a job, aren't you? It's like yeah, <laughs> it's such a high emphasis back in like the late eight, uh, 80s. Like, are you working? Do, yeah. do you work? Or are you on the dole? Or 
Yeah. Well, there, was, there was some very, very weird television back in, uh, yeah. a bit before that, you know. I mean, 3 2 1 with, uh, with what do you call them? With, um, it wasn't Jim Rogers, come with the guy's name, but. Uh, oh, 3 2 1, yeah. Dust, dust, dusty Bin, and yes, uh, yes. then you had the, like, uh, Tiz Was, and. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's some very but, odd. But um, again, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get away with some of the stuff now. How. Um, I, I mean, I'm not talking ill about Jim Bourne, because, I mean, yeah. I absolutely love him. And, um, but uh, talking quite derogatory to women yeah. um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head but you only have to watch a couple of episodes yeah. to see how he refers to women and uh, yeah. you, you, you simply would not get it not so much get away with that it wouldn't be allowed now yeah well certainly on to mainstream television yeah I absolutely love this shot of Narnia in the middle of nowhere it, um, it kind of it kind of reminds me of um, a film film a lot of years ago called Blazing Saddles. Oh yes, yeah, the old Mel Brooks film. I haven't seen it for a few years. Yeah, so um, there's a there's a time when uh, the sheriff, not the black sheriff, the uh, white sheriff, and he, he goes he goes with his boys along. Uh, there's about 25 of them all on horseback uh, r- uh, running through the Wild West, and then they come to a toll, and uh, the toll the toll comes down as as just as they're going through the toll but there's a toll in the middle of nowhere there's like just like this and um and these they all go whoa 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 on the horses and uh and he just says to the guy uh some someone's gonna go back and you know gonna have to get a shit a shitload of dimes and um but as you well know yourself mark they could just they could have just went round on the horse yeah, just ride round it yeah, yeah. but th- that kind of reminds us of that and they've also got the um They've also got the uh, like a crime scene, like death handprint of like someone just came to a came to a grisly end. Yes, I mean it's, it was quite funny because I'd, I'd been working in um, in red car that day and I can't, I can't remember what I was doing, but I came back to the car which was parked on Majuba Road, and it was just uh, there was there was two young lads who uh, had a tin of pink paint, and they were actually just I just got there just to finish off scro- scrolling Narnia on the uh, in the fence, so I pulled out a camera because I found it really funny and started taking pictures. Um, or well, they saw the camera and they, they they ran off thinking I was sort of like you know collecting evidence or something you know yeah. uh, and I, anyway so I, I, I they ran away so I took a few pictures and anyway they cause they're, they're hiding around the corner and sort of see me and it's it's obvious I'm not there for yeah. you know for whatever you know it's, it's, so they come out and you know a bit bit sheepishly and now uh, he just had a, had a bit of chat on you know so sort of like just it was just funny you know. So. Yeah, of course. I mean, this um, o- um, also catches me eye, Mark, this um, like Stanley Kubrick-esque two- 2001 A Space Odyssey. But um, it looks like the monolith in the middle of, in the middle of like a desolate uh, wasteland. But you, you have uh, described this as it's actually a miner's lift. Yeah, this is actually the cage, thing called the cage, which was this sort of like the, um, like the sort of metal box that uh, would actually kind of transport the uh, the miners down into the uh, da- down the shaft to uh, to to go to work so um you know this was the one that was used but that was at Easton colliery at the actual pit um and it's now a uh, memorial or a monument to the um you know to the you know the past mining heritage of uh, of Easton colliery of the, uh, of the of the village and it stands on the uh, on the headland you know, above the beach where I where I actually shot the you know the coal scavengers and the coal picker pictures, you know, back in the uh, back in the uh, back in the eighties. Wow, brilliant! And um, and if we could just go to here, Mark, because we're kind of running the theme of um, Ridley Scott, whereas this to me looks like a like a dystopian landscape of Blade Runner, kind of with the lights turned on. Yes, kind of. I mean, it's the this picture is mirroring the the first picture, which is the Garden Festival picture, um, and that was so. The, so the Garden Festival picture was very much this idea of like you know, kind of like techno utopia. You know, we'd all be living, we'd all be working three day weeks, driving around in sort of flying cars, and you know, living like the Jetsons. You know, sort of. Um, and obviously, it never happened. You know, so it, it's, to me, it's like this, this kind of almost acts as a, like a visual metaphor, or or or, or um, you know. This is this is the dream being dismantled. This is the this is the spaceship being dismantled, you know. So there's, there's, so there's a visual there's a, there's a visual echo of the first image and the last image, you know, the dream 
than the reality or this is what happens 40 years later 35 years later wow wow absolutely brilliant um and for all the for all the right or wrong reasons maggie thatcher catches me eye again um and i think this is i think you've got a little story here mark um (laughs) um it's probably it's probably the greatest shot i've ever seen of margaret thatcher she actually looks human there (laughs) <laughs> right, I've never heard me say that before. Um, yeah, I, mean, I shot this photograph at the, the Scottish Conservative Party conference in uh, Perth in, uh, I can't remember when, uh, oh, 1989, <clears throat> pardon me. And I photographed Thatcher a few times before, um, in a, you know, in a, in a scrum situation. And um, firstly at uh, Wembley Conference Centre in 1986, um, no, 1987 rather at the time of the 1987 general election which is going like you know um, did like a big sort of like rally at the uh, just before the election at, uh, at Wembley and um, Thatcher was always quite weird about being photographed coming off stage you know, pressing you know pressing flesh you know sort of like she, um, sometimes she wanted it and other times she didn't you know at, at, at Wembley she uh, she was perfectly fine about it she wanted the camera she wanted the television cameras and the um, and the photographers following her um, you know, and I was fairly early on in my career, and um, you know, she came off stage at Wembley, and um, you know, made her made her way up the steps to a, you know to one of the terraces, and then sort of like you know her and the sort of like the media scrum, you know, and the, and the close protection officers, you know, sort of made their way along the uh, along the terrace. So I kind of like looked, and I kind of was just going that way, and she'll be probably about there in about 20 seconds. So I kind of like you know just start jumping across seats, you know. Pushing Tories out the way, you know. So anyway, so I finally like jumped the barrier on into the uh, in the space between, you know, sort of like the uh, the press scrum and Thatcher, and fell on, fell flat on my ass. And anyway, so I saw kind of like, <clears throat> pardon me, Margaret Thatcher and Norman Ted bearing down on me, like you know, my life flashing, you know, fla- flashing before me as I thought I'm going to get trampled to death by, uh, you know, by the prime minister and uh, and, a, and a senior Tory cabinet minister. But uh, anyway, I got I got I got lifted back up right by one of the, uh, you know, by close protection officers, and carried on. But this picture here I shot in Perth two two years later, and uh, Thatcher didn't want to be photographed at the, after a speech. So what I did is about uh, about about two minutes before the uh, the end of the speech, I went to the back of the hall, and there was like two rows running front to back from the um, so I made decisions about which um, you know about which um, aisle she might come up, and uh, she decides and, and I I chose right. She came up the uh, she came up the right hand aisle, so um, as she got to the end of the as she got end of the row of seats, I stepped out of the uh, stepped out of the row of seats. You know, I think I've probably got maybe two pictures off, like including this one, before the uh, you know kind of close protection officer kind of grabbed hold of me and just like dragged me out of the uh, you know out of the uh, you know out of the melee. But it was no melee because I was the only photographer who did that. He'd like kind of done that. So uh, anyway, at the end of it, I'm you know I've got I've got the pictures and I'm uh, you know at the end of the day, so I'm packing up my kit and I see the uh, I see I see the I see the CPO, the close protection officer coming towards me. I thought, oh fucking hell, he's going to give me a he's going to give me a bollock and. And uh, he goes, fucking hell, son, he says, and they gave me a fucking heart attack. You know, he, was, he was fine about it, you know. I think you realise that, that, you know, we both had roles to play, you know, and in this instance, I'd, sort of, I'd, I'd, I'd got lucky. Yeah, I'm just also curious as well, because in the, in the late 80s, why does every Tory supporter look, look like that? Um... It was the uppies, wasn't it? You yeah. know, it was like kind of, you know, you know, it was like with Tashini, uh, t- t- not Tashini, what do you call it? Uh, Pringle, uh, Pringle, yeah. pr- pr- Pringle jumpers and big glasses and, uh, you know, it's, um, yeah. And, so, and again, it's like I allude to that with the, you know, the, the photograph below, you know, so like, the, you know, the wheel clamped yuppie. And, uh, and this is actually quite funny. I mean, it's me and a few mates were on the piss in um, the West End of London one afternoon. Well, it's Friday afternoon, I think it was, and um, I look up, and um, this guy's come back to find these uh, to find these sports cars being wheel clamped. So, uh, so I just kind of went over with the camera and started taking pictures, and he wasn't bothered. I mean, I actually think he was actually quite pleased, you know. Mm. I think it was like kind of like, well, I've got so much money, I just don't care about having my car wheel clamped, you know. So I mean, I've got I've got probably about twelve different frames of this. It wasn't you know, a surreptitiously grab shot before the guy told me to bugger off. It was, yeah. sort of, uh, you know, he was, he was almost playing up with the camera. Wow. wow. Um, yeah, I love that. Uh, yeah, this, this, 
this picture kind of just acts as, <coughs> pardon me, acts as like a, um, it's like kind of like a visual metaphor, it's like kind of like a visual device to kind of like shift from, you know, from, you know, from the sort of like Thatcher, you know, non, non northeast pictures through to the northeastern, the, the, the northeastern narrative, you know, so I mean, this, this was just shot in the, uh, in the time tunnel, um, I suppose I, should, I suppose I probably should say it's like done by a trained monkey from the back seat, you know, stop me from getting a, stop me from getting arrested for what you call for taking pictures from the car with, um, with, uh, with one arm, with, with one hand on the wheel and one with, hand. One on the wheel, is, yes, sir. I, I wasn't looking at the viewfinder, so. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yes, your secret's safe with me, mate. You're, you're fine. Probably need to touch on um, the foot and mouth, the foot, uh, foot and mouth uh, disease. Was that was that late nineties? No, it was uh, two thousand and one. If I want to remember, so let's just check the. Um, yes, two thousand and one. I mean, this was shot in April two thousand and one. I mean, foot and mouth kind of kicked off in uh, I think it was February. If I want to remember, of two thousand and one, uh, it, it was it was horrible. You know, you you, you go up to Cumbria, or you kind of like go you, you you go up sort of like heart side, just like look west, you know, across Cumbria from from the height, you could just see, you know, just. A dozen pyres burning in the distance, you know, sort of like just the waste was just awful. And then I'm quite interested in this because these look like photographs on some kind of canvas. Is that right? Kind of. It's, I mean, it's a Trump loyal wall. So what it was, it's, it was the, it was the uh, museum at South Shields. They used to have this um, this display to, uh, to Catherine Cookson. Um, you know, which, where they'd sort of like done out this room to make it look as if it was like the kind of street that Catherine Cookson was, um, um, you know, was um, was brought up on. So you had like a three D bit, which people were walking around. But then to extend it, they just built, they just um, painted a Trump loyal. Wow. So they just kind of continued the street wow. into uh, really unusual. But it's um, yeah. But I mean, this picture has been included just to you know just just talk about issues like you know sort of like heritage and you know how we see the past and you know how we perceive the past, you know, and, and how romantic we are about the past, if you like, as well. And then talking about the past, we've got a really nice shot of the iconic Get Caught at Car Park and Gateshead. Yeah. Um, absolutely love this mob. Thank you. Um, that was when was that? That was um, 2000. So I, I can't remember. It, I mean, it lasted a few years after that. I mean, it's um, um, but it was. <clears throat> pardon me. And I shot this picture when um, I think there's a couple of guys got got got, uh, got access to the you know the pavilion on the top that uh, you know that they were going to turn into a, into a restaurant, but it obviously never happened. Um, but the um, it was done when I think it was done when that kind of like that dreadful remake of uh, Get Carter was made, the American remake, and uh, a couple of guys who were like real sort of film buffs managed to get access, <coughs> pardon me, to the uh, you know to the you know to the, to the pavilion and sort of like do a you know bit, 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 bit of a tour. It's where it's 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 also where he famously throws um, Cliff Rumby Cliff Rumby off off the uh, off, yeah off Roberts even the, yeah. Um, you're a big man, but you're out of shape for me. It's a full-time job. Uh, but that, that was actually the scene in uh, in Low Fell. It was, uh, it was uh, I think you threw them off with. Um, they killed my brother. That was the uh, <laughs> before dropping them from the uh, yeah. you know, from the uh, from from the walkway. <laughs> Another classic film, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the whole projects. You know, it is is it's kind of multifaceted in that it, you know there, there are references to things like Get Carter, to you know Blade Runner, you know just just kind of all of the cultural references that um, you know that, you know that, that that I draw on because strange I mean you kind of think of like documentary photography as being is being about documents about you know about documenting the external but at the same time it's there's a, there's a form of autobiography here as well in that it's as much about the references the cultural references that actually influence me to, in what I decide to photograph or how I, or how I decide to photograph or how I choose to sequence this um, you know this this, this 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 piece of work in that yes it's kind of it is documentary but it's also a document to my to, you know, obviously to the way that I see the world you know, so there, there is a certain amount, a certain amount of autobiography in there. Mark, it's been absolutely brilliant coming coming to Sunderland, and uh, it's a, it's actually the first time I've been here, which I'm quite ashamed to say. Um, but it's an absolute fantastic space. 
It is a great space, isn't it? It's just, um, it's just a shame it's not going to be here for much longer. Because obviously the, uh, the the glass centre's um, you know, scheduled for closure in a year, in a, in a, in a couple of years. But um, but yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a brilliant space to be uh, to be exhibiting, and you know, and it's and again, it's like you know, it's, it's such a good opportunity as well. You know, it's I mean, I've not really done much uh, exhibiting for the last uh, you know the last 30 years or so um having tended to um you know kind of be working on you know sort of like you know making a living really so uh, so you know so when so when the ngca kind of came to me uh three years before lockdown and said would you like to do something i just kind of obviously i jumped at the opportunity you know I mean, especially when there was a book involved as well for the people who don't know more, could you um, could you tell where, where the exhibition is, when it starts, and uh, when it ends, please? Yeah, the exhibition is at Northern Gallery of Contemporary Art, which is uh, downstairs at the Glass Centre, um, at the far end of the uh, the far end of the cafe of the restaurant, and it runs from the uh, the fourth of February till I think the seventeenth of um, maybe March, so it's about seventeenth or eighteenth of April, thereabouts, not exactly, but it's on it's on for, it's on for just over two months. Um, it's free. Um, I can't remember if it's actually uh, closed on a Monday or not, but uh, obviously check that out. Make sure, I think it. I think it is actually open on a Monday, but uh, but check that out. But it's um, yeah, two months. You have two months to see it. Mark, thanks a lot. It's been re- really Thank great you. chatting to you. I'm. Um, I've been a, a fan of your work. I've looked at your work for many years. I actually wanted to get in touch with you about two, three years ago. Yeah. But then it, uh, you know how things go. I think there was like uh, lockdown and stuff. Um, everyone's priorities change but like I said the shots from uh, Scottswood you've really captured the imagination and you've created like a space and time with uh, with those shots uh, whereas I can't think of anyone else has profiled Scottswood the way you've documented the whole entire place so Thanks for that, mate, and uh, I really appreciate that because uh, it's somewhere where I've spent a lot of time, and I know the places. I just have to flick through the pages, and I know where I, I know exactly where you've been. So, thanks for that, mate. Thank you, thank you. I, mean, I, I hope it, um, you know, I hope it resonates with um, you know everybody who sees it as well. You know, I, mean, I think. I think depending on how old you are, it's, it, will, it will it will resonate in different ways, but. Um, I just hope it creates a discussion, or just, you know, it just, or just, you know, creates a, uh, just an- another way of looking at the uh, looking at the northeast, really, or just kind of, you know, you know, the everyday, really, but a different way of seeing the everyday. But again, yes, thank you, thank you very much. No problem, Mark. Thanks a lot.